I uh, really felt from the Lord several things uh, about our time together, one of them being the importance of the shofar. That may sound funny to you, but uh, this is a time of uh, trumpeting some things and really felt to ask uh, my dear friend Ralph Cook to come and uh, just to minister to us with the shofar. Just give a word of explanation about the conference. Brad, you can stay here by me if you don't mind for a second. Uh, Larry and I had been discussing a conference and um, had set aside actually these dates. Uh, Larry and I had to, some others to do a conference, and Larry called me, said, Terry, it's just not going to work. Um, so, you know, honestly, guys, I was, I was uh, thankful, not because we weren't doing the conference so much, as I'm thankful to be home, and I'm home so little. But uh, that day after I talked to Larry, I went downstairs and was just uh, encountered by the Lord, who spoke directly to me, and here's what he said. He said, uh, no, he said, I want you to do a conference here in Dixon. He said, and you are to invite Larry Randolph and Brad Alfred. He said, you are to name the conference unto the Lamb. And he said, this will really bless bread and will kick the door open for him. And so I called Larry. I said, Larry, you know, uh, can we still do it together, do the conference here? He was uh, more than uh, happy to do that. He checked and made sure he could do it. He was able to. Then I called Brad and told Brad, I said, Brad, here's what's in my heart to do. I'm just verifying this. Brad and Larry both are here. Uh, I said, Brad, here's what I feel the Lord has told me to do. Would you be willing to come? And I said, the Lord told me that this would really bless you and would kick the door open for you. And so um, you might want to tell the rest of it, Brad, what you told me. (laughs) I was stunned. (laughs) But I said, um, you know, I've been working on a lot of songs about the Lamb. And uh, in this new CD that... I'm going to be putting out, the Lord told me to title it, Unto the Lamb. And so we both laughed, and that's the name of the conference, Unto the Lamb. So that's a confirmation. Yes. So you can get um, the Unto the Lamb CD back on the table back there and some other things that Brad brought. Also, Larry has a table out front as well. So I just ask you to, at your own uh, time and desire, to look on the tables and uh, Anything that you see that you want to purchase, I know it will bless them. So, amen. Why don't we stand for just a second? And now, Lamb of God. We declare that unto you do we give our hearts. Unto you do we give our time. Unto you do we give our past. And unto you do we give our present. And unto you do we give our future. Unto you do we give everything within and everything without. We present ourselves to you, Lamb of God, to be your people, a people, a bride called by your name. Before you, Lamb of God, we present our vows. We covenant with you to be your bride and yours alone. Forsaking all others, we cling to you. For you alone are worthy. Amen. 
May your purifying fire, Lamb of God, purify our very hearts. May you burn within us in this time of covenant and consecration and commitment. Burn within us, O oh God. Seal this covenant by fire, by passion, by the Spirit of the Lord. Just ask you just to put your hands on your chest. Seal our hearts. Put a seal upon our hearts, O oh God. The very fire of your presence, your own passion towards us our passion back unto you. We are yours and you are ours. And we declare that to you tonight, Lord. Burn. Burn, Spirit of the Lord. The very name of the Lord upon our hearts, upon our foreheads. The name of the Lamb. We're your possession. Wholehearted tonight, holding nothing back, nothing restrained, everything given over to you, Lord. We come. We are yours. In this hour and forever, we are yours. ask you, Holy Spirit, to keep your hand upon our hearts throughout this time. We give you permission, Holy Spirit, to burn away the dross, to refine us, to challenge us, to purify a people, a people that will come out to you. We come out to you, Lord, as your people. We come out to you. We give you freedom to shake us. We give you freedom to awaken us with a kiss or with shaking, it doesn't matter. But awaken us, oh God. ask you to fan the flame, that holy flame, a passion for the Lamb of God within our hearts. Spirit of God, breathe upon us even now, upon the embers, and reignite that passion, reignite that flame, reignite that fire for you and you alone, O oh God. You alone satisfy us. You alone are the one we yearn for, long for, hunger for, thirst for. You are our all in all. You do it for us, O oh God. We welcome travail tonight. The Spirit of God in travail. We welcome you in that work, Holy Spirit. You are never interrupting us with travail. It is always our joy. So have your way in your freedom. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, to be all that you are. Lamb of God, to be all that you are among us. Take all the restraints off, all that binds, all that hinders. Break the power of the lie in our hearts. Break its power tonight disagree with me over that in a second break the power of the lie break it in our hearts, break it in our minds break it in our understanding you would call us out to yourself you would summon us out of Babylon itself 
we come out to you, Lord. We come out to you. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. move on your heart for a second. The bride is the bride first because of her heart. It is his. Emancipate us, O oh God, from all other loves. Emancipate us from distractions. Yes. Yes. Emancipate us from fear. Emancipate us from offense. the sword of the Lord pierce even our hearts now to emancipate us to truly become our freedom not move out and under that sensitivity. It is extraordinarily important that my heart, your heart, remain sensitive to the Lord at all times. That's what, uh, I want that every day, not just during this time, but every day. I want to be trained in that way by the Holy Spirit to be sensitive to Him not insensitive, not to put my head down and go through life in a blur. But for my eyes, especially my spirit, to be open to see. See what's really going on in the workplace. What's really going on in the marketplace. What's really going on in our homes. Give you permission, Lord, to let us see beyond the clouds, beyond the curtains, beyond the offenses. Pull those things back for a moment. Let us truly see. Beyond our natural mindedness, the stronghold of our brain, our soul. To truly see. Put your hands over your eyes for a second. Open our eyes, O oh God. We're afraid to truly see. We're afraid of what we may see, what we may not like. But I ask you, Lord, to remove those veils. Remove that spirit.
spirit of fear. You've not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, soundness of mind. Open our eyes. Open our eyes. Most of all, we would see you, Lamb of God. We would behold the Lamb. Yes, Lamb of God, we would behold you. Unto further transformation, to conformity to your image. Welcome the spirit of burning upon us. I'm aware of that in the room, the spirit of God. God is a consuming fire. He is a consuming fire. His burning will be among us. We welcome you, consuming fire that you are. Burn. Come among us, as Malachi 3 says, as a refiner's fire, a launderer's soap. Be released tonight, spirit of fire. Bring true freedom to us. Miraculous healing, healing, deliverances, the breaking of strongholds, the removing of offenses. Bless you, Lord. Bless you. Well, amen. Just stay sensitive. I uh, want to read a few passages of Scripture, just a few fragments. And um, believing the Lord to, um, even through the Scriptures, to prepare us for this time. So Malachi chapter 3, we'll begin with verse number 1 of Malachi chapter 3. Behold, I'm going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? And he is going to appear. That is a direct statement. Um, Isaiah 40, verse 5, will back this up. The Lord himself aims to appear. There's two types of appearing. There's the inward appearing unto transformation. There is also the outward appearance unto testimony. It will be an in-your-face time as the Lamb appears. In unexpected ways, unexpected times. Individually, congregationally, even in secular scenarios, the Lamb will appear. So just wanted to stop and Add a little umph to that statement there. He is not kidding. He is going to appear. I'm not talking about the second coming, obviously then. I'm talking about 
now. And he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. And how can you live with a consuming fire? There's only one way to become one with that fire. Only one way. Verse 3, and he will set as a smelter and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi. So it's the priesthood that he's coming to firstly. He will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. When I draw near to you for judgment and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against those who swear falsely and against those who oppress the wage earner in his wages, the widow and the orphan and those who turn aside uh, the alien and do not, catch this, fear me. So I want to underline that for a second. Do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. For if, for, excuse me, I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. Then verse 16, same chapter. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. Those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. We're living in that time again. I understand cycles somewhat from the scriptures. I understand the cycle when this book, Malachi, was written, when it was written, what was going on among God's people when it was written, particularly relates to the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. But these things are in cycles, else this is a history book and we may as well go home. This is not a history book. It is a direct statement of God of how he deals when he is recovering his own testimony among his people, among the nations. Those who feared the Lord spoke to one another and the Lord gave attention and heard it and a book of remembrance was written before him for those who feared the Lord and who esteemed his name. The context of this, I want to speak clearly about this, then relates to the people who were living in Babylon who feared the Lord and would become the remnant who came out of Babylon to the Lord. It's key that we understand that progression. Those who feared the Lord became those who who were in Babylon, became those who came out of Babylon in order to return to the Lord. Verse 17, here's the Lord's response. They will be mine. If we don't see the bridal paradigm in that, we must see it. They will be mine, says the Lord, on the day that I prepare my own possession. Should remind us of uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. You're a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are a people of God's own possession. And I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. So you will again distinguish. This is the word of the Lord to us. There will again be a distinguishing between the righteous and the wicked, particularly in what's called the church. I'm going to say it stronger. I'm not just saying this to say it. It's not because, well, I've read this in the Bible. No, no, no. The Lord spoke directly to me about this. Just say it right to you that way. I'm going to be really bold on some things. The Lord is forcing me to say things that I would not normally say. Those who know me understand that dynamic. But I'm going to be very bold on some things. And some of the things the Lord's going to have to drag out of me. So pray for me. Listen. 
There's about to be a distinguishing that's going to go on in what is called the church. A bride is going to come out to him. But it will be a remnant, and most will remain in Babylon. Prepare your hearts. You will again distinguish between the righteous and the wicked, between ones who serve God and the one who does not serve him. This happy gospel that says live like you want to, God doesn't mind, is about to be encountered with the living lamb and the fire of his presence. And... uh, If you want to hear what's going to happen, the Lord will have to drag the rest of that out of me, so pray for me. Verse chapter 4, verse number 1. For behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace. I'm telling you that first that burning is coming to us. That refiner's fire is first coming to us. And all the arrogant... And every evildoer will be chaff. And the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, see, let me say this to us. The Lord is about to recover the fear of the Lord in his house. Yes, like you, I've been hearing this for years. I've been hearing it for the Lord for years. I've been hearing others say it for years. I'm going to just say this very boldly. As a trumpet, it is about to be on our watch. I do not mean a couple of years it has begun. It has begun. I'll tell you why as I get into this. It has begun. The fear of the Lord is coming. And something even greater than that, what I've come to call the terror of the Lord, is coming. He is not who we've made him to be. So, but for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. And you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall, and you will tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day which I am preparing, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of Moses, my servant. Even the statutes and ordinances which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel. That's not an offhand remark by Malachi. Malachi, under the spirit of revelation, is seeing what is coming, not only in their time, but he's seeing what's coming in cycles through history, all the way to our day and beyond. And he's bringing out two particular, let's say it this way, men representing very specifically a missional anointing of God speaking of what happens in the cycles. So Moses is not an offhand remark. Moses is brought out by the Spirit of God to point to that servant and the missional anointing that was up on Moses to gather a people and lead them out of slavery and bondage. Very similar to the time Malachi is writing in. God's people are again in slavery and bondage in Babylon. Verse 5, behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet. Let me say what God is not saying here. I'm going to send you a person who thinks they are Elijah the prophet. (laughs) That is not what the Lord said. Elijah is going to come. Get ready. He is going to appear, maybe in this meeting. He has been released. He will be appearing in many meetings at various times. It's already begun. It's not, this is not, it's going to. He has already been going on. It's the time in which we live. Some will see him with their open eyes, others in the spirit doesn't matter if you see him with your open eyes. In order to get the full message, you'll have to turn inward to the Spirit. You can never get the full message in your outward natural eyes. They're too easily deceived. 
to get the full message, the eyes of our heart will have to be trained. I know that's offensive to our natural mind, so be it. Behold, I'm going to send to you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children. Let me say what is not being said here, and there's reasons uh, without going into all this, but he's not saying there's going to be a generational move of God. He is saying that the children's hearts are away from God, and God aims to turn their hearts back to the God of their fathers. That's what he's saying. There's proof in Kings as to the truth of this statement in the life and ministry of Elijah himself. It's proof in this very book in chapter 3 about this, the fact of this, so that the father's hearts turns, their heart for God comes upon the children. We would be those children. And the children's hearts turns back to the God of their father's. This is not a move where fathers and children get reconciled. This is a heavenly father movement. And we, his children, hearts get reconciled back to him. That's the true meaning of this passage. How can you be so bold? Because I was told that by the Lord himself. If you want it plainly, I'll give it to you plainly. But the scriptures will back it up if we will look into it. So usually what happens with me, the Lord says it, and then I go into the scriptures and say, okay, there's a lot of things that I don't believe right now, and the reason I don't believe them is because the Lord hasn't told me. And I can't tell you the number of things that I did not believe three months ago that I now believe because the Lord says, get a clue, son, because you don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> I want that. I need that. Disrupt me, Lord. That's where I'm at with this. The only one I want to believe in is him anyway. All the other stuff is crap to me. And I'm not interested in crap other than flushing it down the commode. <laughs> How about you? So the Lord's got a big plunger <laughs> and we need an enema. I do. So I'm doing this to offend you. If you can be offended by this, get out because what's coming? I'm not talking about in this time. Listen, folks, I would be doing you a great disservice if I did not warn us about what's to, what is about to happen. We will be greatly offended in the days to come because of our stupid religious belief systems. We know things about him, but we don't know him. And he's become powerless, and he's become academic to us. And he's about to overturn our money-changing tables. Amen. Amen. And you know what I'm saying, and probably you wouldn't be here if you weren't saying the same thing. Sick us, God. Put a bullseye on my chest and shoot. That's where I'm at. I'm not praying, oh, Lord, help us. That's not my prayer. I'm praying, Lord, get us. This is all uh, a setup for the knockout blow. So, uh, <laughs> all right, so we're, we're looking at Malachi 3 and 4. Now, let's look at a few other passages here. Let's turn to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Let's begin reading uh, with verse 11, Luke chapter 1. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him, Zechariah, standing to the right of the altar of incense. The Holy Spirit would have never put the location in here that he was standing if it was not meaningful. God never mints his word and never wastes words. It's up to us to find out the significance of why Gabriel is standing next to the altar of incense. The altar of incense is where the lamb was offered once a year by the high priest. God's precise if he's anything. 
He's way too specific. He is not general at all. And the lamb is in view in these passages. Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear gripped him. And the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your... Pos- for your uh, excuse me, my, my pages are blowing around a little too much. I might have to turn that just a little bit. Um, for your petition has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. And you will give him the name John. And you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. And he will be great in the sight of the Lord and he will drink no wine or liquor. And he will be filled. See, he has a religious spirit. He's born with it. No, he's born with the Holy Spirit. And he's got something better than wine and liquor. Most of the church is drinking right now. Just, just excuse me, because we have so little of the Holy Spirit, we need some other stimulant. I'm not against you taking a drink. I am against the lack of the Holy Spirit that is in the body of Christ. I will never be okay with this nonsense. The Holy Spirit should do it for us, folks. Am I saying it's a sin to drink? No, hear what I'm trying to say to us. Liquor and all its varied forms, wine, is used in the scriptures to point to a living relationship with a living lamb who satisfies me. Now, I do not need mind-numbing drugs. I'm really bold tonight, aren't I? Listen. I've heard this thing talked about from so many directions. Just let me put my... My point on this, listen, we need the Holy Spirit in a measure that satisfies us. That, listen, and I don't mean a little dab of Jesus. We need something that is consuming called the fire among us. And until we get it, we are going to continue to go down this stupid pathway of mind-numbing things, whether it be the television, whatever it is, living in a fantasy land. I'm telling you the fire of God is coming. And that burning of the Lord is coming. The purifying inward burning of the lamb is coming. He is looking for a bride, not a distracted wench. He's looking for a companion, not someone just wearing a ring. You can be married and not be companions. That's the condition of what's in the house of God right now. We're married, but we're not companions. We've not come into the oneness of God's purpose in our marriages. We're too independent for that. Anyway, the bride will have none of that. She'll have the Lord and nothing else. Amen. She'll have the lamb. She is his, and he is hers. It is mutual. So, all right. So listen, brothers and sisters, if you're going to drink wine, I pray that God will do something. I'm not against drinking wine. I'm really not. But I'm saying, trying to say something to us here. Like, and I can talk about many things in this place. I've seen too much of it. Do we want the Lord as much as what we want those stimulants? Are we after him more than we're after them? And I'm talking about everything now, not just wine, not just liquor. Houston, we've got a problem, and there's not an easy fix to it. It demands a cost, consecration, dedication, and commitment to the Lord himself. Amen. Oh, they got really quiet really quick, which I, I don't mind. I'm used to it. I'm, most of the time, I'm the only one talking. <laughs> when I should probably be shutting up. But listen, brothers, don't we want 
what the wine in the scripture represents, the Holy Spirit. As Paul says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't be filled with wine where is an excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Amen. Our cure lies in the measure of Christ filling us, not in the measure of liquor you got left in the pint. Amen. Oh, enough of that. So what we're seeing here then in these verses and these chapters, we're seeing something that I, I want to just launch into this for a second. We'll finish up uh, this and then launch into it. But we're seeing the foretelling here of God's, it's beyond a movement, of God's eternal purpose coming into play. That's what's going on here in this passage of scripture in Luke chapter 1. The one who's coming out, Gabriel's saying, is going to turn back many of the sons of Israel to the Lord their God. Now, couple that with what's being said in Malachi chapter 4. It's turning the children of Israel of that day back to the heart of their fathers, their heart for God. David had a heart for God, didn't he? Listen, there's history in this, in all of us sitting here. Enoch, he had a heart for God, and he didn't have the law. Didn't need the law. He had the Lord. Job had a heart for God, didn't have the law, didn't need the law. The law was only a tutor to lead people to a person. But most people were so content to be under the law that they forgot about the person. But not David. David came out and under the law and to the person. So that in the Psalms, he says, sacrifice and offering you take no pleasure in. Well, just what covenant are you living in? I'll tell you what covenant he's not living in, under the law. That's right. The law was a tutor to get people out to the person again, like Enoch believed in, like Job believed in, like Abraham believed in, like Melchizedek believed. We have a history to this. Men and women who wanted the Lord himself, he did it for them. But like, much like Israel, the church is now in the same place. We have our churchiness and we have our stuff. We just don't have the Lord, do we, Mike? And we've got this Christian law that's operating among us now called the church and its meetings and its gatherings. And I'm sick of it. We need the Lord. That's who we need. I need him. You need him, brothers and sisters. Are you with me in that? Can God not get a people out of the church and back to the Lord? The church has become Babylon. Somebody needs to say it. Let me tell it to you. The system that is in the church is no system, than the, no different than the system of the world. It is a Babylonian si- system built by this. Make a name for yourself. Tell me that's not the truth. God is moving again. Thank God he is, Tony. He's moving to get a people out of this stupid church system and back to him. Am I praying, oh God, save our system? No, I'm praying the opposite. Wipe this thing off the face of the earth. It doesn't have your name. It does not have your testimony. And your glory is not in it. All right. Feel free to leave. <laughs> Listen, run for your life if you want to. If it's that precious to you. No, brothers and sisters. I've had enough. How about you? That's not, that didn't start yesterday either. Somewhere down the line, we've got to stop being politically correct. It's not getting us anywhere but in the same hole. And if we're going to speak, let's speak as the oracles of God are set down and shut up. How about that? <laughs> See, it's wonders what I can say when I'm having my own conference. <laughs> Poor Larry said, I hear thinking Terry's going to get us all stoned. <laughs> He's not. Larry's with me. So is Brad. That's why I got these two right here. So they got this whole line right here. <laughs> these are the weird ones up here. <laughs> Actually, you're all weird. <laughs> you wouldn't be here if you weren't weird. 
Why is it so weird to want the Lord in an unrestricted, unrestrained way? Why is it so, so weird to believe that God can do the same thing today that he did yesterday? Right. That he's the same God and he wants to do the same thing. Yeah. Inward, outward does not matter to him. He's after us. Yeah. <laughs> I love that about him, don't you? So see, what God is doing here in, in Luke chapter 1 is what he's about to do among us. That's why I'm bringing this passage out. Verse 17, and it is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah, underline that, in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient, see, the disobedient back to the attitude of the righteous. So as to make ready, here's the purpose of the ministry of the spirit and power of Elijah, to make ready a people prepared for the lamb. That is the purpose. It is not a self-centered purpose. It is never about the vessel. It is always about the lamb. Amen. You know that to be true in your inward man for just a second where you're, the spirit of Christ lives in you. Tell me that's not true. It has never been about us, the vessel. It has forever been about the lamb seeking a bride. Zacharias said to the angel, verse 18, how shall I know this for certain? For I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years. Here's the principle God would teach us. It is never by, come on in, sisters. There's some two seats down here if you want to be down where I can spit on you real good. Just, uh, no, just kidding. Yeah, just come on down. <laughs> That's right. Just spit back. I'll, I'm used to it. <laughs> Where was I? Oh, yes. <laughs> so you hear God wants to establish this principle. God cannot use a vessel that thinks that it can do it and accomplish it. He will never use that vessel to accomplish his true intention. He will only use a vessel that is past its ability to perform. That's absolutely right. It is the barren womb that the Lord is born in. The womb that is dead. It's what God wants to show Abraham about Sarah. I'm going to take her womb into menopause and kill it. And then I'm going to bring a son right out of it. <laughs> Therefore, the prophecy is very clear. The children of the barren woman shall be greater than the children of Hagar. Amen. So what's going on here? The flesh cannot accomplish what only God in the spirit can do. This is not a matter of, look at me, I'm a vessel. I do this and I do that. And you'll never be used of God if you live in that arena. That pride, that arrogance that thinks we're somebody, that we've accomplished somebody, we've made a name for ourselves. No, the Lord is looking for weak vessels, dead, wombed vessels. Elizabeth is well past her years. She's gone through menopause and her womb's dead. Just like Sarah. Amen? Amen? God loves to prove these types of points. He does it with Abraham. He does it with Isaac. He does it with Jacob and their wives. Closes the womb. What the Lord is about to do among us will not be according to the flesh. Not be according to anything we've known. Anything we've seen. That bears repeating because... You're not listening. What the Lord is about to do will not be in accordance with anything that we have known or seen. In fact, for the Lord to accomplish that purpose, he must get us out of our minds. 
Your neighbors have thought that about you all along anyway. Right. Might as well prove them right. Yeah. Or have like I do and have good neighbors. <laughs> Dan and Lisa <laughs> living next to us. They're out of their minds too. Our old block's out of their minds. We're going to build a subdivision after this is all over. <laughs> I'm going to name it the Out of Your Mind Subdivision. Larry said he's going to buy the first house. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, anyway, so, so what we'll always find in this, brothers and sisters, is God's movement, God's recovery, God's work is preceded by the impossible. He is never asking us to do the possible. He moves in the realm of the impossible. Absolutely true. I cannot do this, Lord, finally. The Lord says, I can do something. I've, he has called every one of us into this room to an impossible task. We are meant to live in his life in the realm of impossible living. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The hope of purpose. We could go on and on with that. Well, so Zacharias has the, uh, the right questions. How shall I know this for certain? That's the reason for his questions. Elizabeth is past childbearing. There's nothing natural about this. I'm an old man. My wife, he's politically correct. He doesn't say he's an old woman. <laughs> Women have a way of hearing things even when you're away from them. <laughs> He wasn't sure if Gabriel was a tattletale or not yet. <laughs> so he says, my wife is advanced in years, which politically means she might be older than me. Gabriel isn't going for it. Verse 19, he, the angel answered and said, I'm Gabriel who stands in the presence of God, and I've been sent to speak to you. I'm really trying to make this light because it's about to get really intense. <laughs> I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. Behold, you shall be silent and unable to speak. See, God was answering Elizabeth's prayer. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you will be silent and unable to speak. Elizabeth's over there in the amen corner. <laughs> more, Lord, more. <laughs> Longer. <laughs> Stronger. <laughs> Kill his voice box. <laughs> uh, whatever. You won't be able to speak until the day when these things take place because you did not believe my words which shall be fulfilled in their proper time. So... Here's what I want us to begin with tonight. This is more of a, a bit of an overview of the past several weeks in my own journey. And uh, where I'm headed with this, uh, the next time I share, it will be specifically concerning the lamb and his bride. We won't get uh, much, at least much, towards the bride tonight, but we will uh, the next time I share some weeks ago, actually, it's been a while, but some weeks ago, let me back up. I better go back further than that. Um, over a year and a half ago, I was out in Portland, Oregon. It was in December, uh, near the end of the year. And I've been waiting, as all of us, I've been waiting on some things. I've, if I've learned and I'm learning anything, I've learned not to have diarrhea of the mouth, prophetically. Just because the Lord tells me something doesn't mean I'm supposed to tell it or say it or whatever. 
Many in the prophetic have diarrhea of the mouth, and I'm looking for a stopper. So is the Lord. Well, uh, the Lord uh, encountered me as the last day of the year, December 2011. He said to me, he said, I'm releasing you to proclaim the Lamb. He said, for the time of the reign of the Lamb has come. And several other things said to me during that time, and so I immediately, like that next night, began to share on this about the time, because I was made aware in the encounter that we had crossed into a different spiritual time. We have to make a distinguishing truth here. There is physical time, and then there is God's time. And the church can discern natural things, but has, I'm afraid, lost its ability to discern spiritual things. Part of that is because we don't believe God speaks anymore. That he wrote us a book and took a hike. Lost his voice, has had laryngitis for these whatever many thousands of years. No. Well, the Lord began to talk about the time of the reign of the Lamb, the coming forth of the Lamb. And so I began to share along those lines and, and uh, those who know me and have... Uh, uh, been a part of my coming there to the various churches that are represented here know that I have shared concerning the lamb will continue to do so but let's back up now a few weeks some weeks ago and uh, this is where the Lord's challenging me so I'm just going to be bold and just tell you what is going on how's that and I hope it doesn't offend you too badly but if it does I'll be glad Uh, I was, uh, just John, jump, jump in the middle of this. I, I love to hang out with the Lord. I love to uh, be in my basement, be alone with him. And, and um, many times the Lord encounters me in my basement. I've always believed there's a play uh, in why so much in the basement. It's about self-abasement. I'm not after, i just say this to you, I'm not after a name. I'm after the Lamb and His glory. That's why I'm going to share with you what I'm going to share. Well, Gabriel, Elijah, and the Lamb of God appeared in my basement. Gabriel made an announcement to me that has to be, and I've had a number of appearances with Gabriel in it over the past however many years. But this, to me, is the most powerful announcement I've ever heard Gabriel announce And this is why I read Luke chapter 1. Gabriel's involvement in this passage is similar to what happened to me. And uh, Gabriel actually brought the passage up to me in the encounter. So I'm sharing it with you. Gabriel announced that God was releasing the spirit and power of Elijah in the earth again. Secondly, He is releasing Elijah himself back into the earth. And thirdly, and this is purpose, unto the coming forth of the Lamb of God. I was on my knees. A lot going on, a lot being said, not only by Gabriel, the Lamb of God himself, speaking... um, Elijah as well speaking to me. I've seen Elijah over the past 30 years at various times, various encounters, but never quite in this kind of mode. And and that needs some explaining, so I'll try my best as the Lord spoke to me to tell you why. Gabriel announced this very specifically and said to this, you must trumpet this, Terry. So here I am. What we've read about in Malachi 3, Malachi 4, what we've read about in Isaiah chapter 40 of the coming of the spirit and power of Elijah into what is termed the last day's ministry. Let me just say this to us. Here's Gabriel's announcement. We have entered that time. 
We're not going to. We already have. As of April of this year, we have entered that time. We are living in an historical, biblical time. What I've read about, what you've read about in your Bibles is the time we are living in. God is unleashing the spirit and power of Elijah. Let me, this will take some, obviously, me talking about it for a little bit. Here's what I mean. Here's what the Lord has shown me over these past time periods about this. The spirit and power of Elijah being released, which is different from Elijah himself being released. The spirit and power of Elijah will be released upon a very specific company of believers. They are part of the bride. They are singularly, collectively known as the friend of the bridegroom. They are the messengers. Gabriel told me they are the burning ones who will be sent to all the earth to announce the coming forth of the Lamb. It is, there, there is, obviously this is true. That company is for signs and wonders concerning the Lamb's coming. It's, that coming is twofold, so we'll need to talk about that in just a second. Along with that release is Elijah himself has been released. This isn't, for me, this isn't just, oh, it's going to happen. It's already been happening. He's appearing to me regularly. How regularly? Well, that's for me to know and you not to find out. <laughs> he is appearing to me regularly and not just me, several others. As would be expected as where I'm standing, this thing is about a company of hidden ones that have been being prepared for this very hour. They've kept themselves pure before the Lord. I do not mean that it's sinless, sinlessness. I mean this. It is a bridal paradigm in their hearts. I am yours and you are mine. Amen. Unreservedly holding nothing back. That in itself is not the call nor the commission. It is more sovereign than that. Than that. But that is an element of those who are in that call. It will be a clear element on display in their midst. The first and most important element will be their desire, their hunger, their love for the Lamb himself. Because their entire, entire ministry of this group is about the Lamb. I want to say that again. The purpose of the ministry is tied directly to the Lamb and His coming out. Elijah as well is coming as a sign. And I'm, if you're like me, over the years I've heard different things, didn't know whether to believe them or not. There's a difference between hearing it from the Lord and hearing it from other people. It's meant to be a difference. When we speak, we're going to need to speak by revelation and not by hearsay. God has no interest in, in raising up a group of echoes. He has great interest in his voice being able to come forth through his vessel. And all of us are meant to be a vessel, though not all of us are meant to move in the spirit and power of Elijah. I'll have to define that. I know, but Elijah is going to come. I've, he said so to me in the encounter. I will pass it on to you. Elijah is going to appear in public meetings, congregational gatherings, not just individuals, but in congregational gatherings. But let me just be clear about what I'm about to say. It's not that Elijah has appeared. That's not what's got my interest. My interest is singular. My desire is that the lamb be seen. Elijah's interest is that the lamb be seen. Those moving in the spirit and power of Elijah have a singular interest to make a people ready for the lamb. That is the ministry. That is their ministry. It is very specific. We knew it was coming. I'm simply announcing to us we are living in that day. 
How long then will it be to the coming out of the Lamb to us, his people? Well, it has begun. How long will it be to the coming of the Lamb to end this age? I do not know. But I know this. We are living in that day. We are living in that day, brothers and sisters. I cannot pinpoint the date, nor will I try here. Do I have an idea? Yes. Do I have an idea from the Lord? Yes. Am I going to tell you? No. (laughs) Hear from the Lord yourself on this. My interest is not so much as to the day that the Lamb is going to put an end to this age. I was told in December 2011, this is what the Lord told me in the encounter, when he released the Lamb to be proclaimed again, here's what he said, that the releasing of the message and the declaration of the Lamb would force the end of the age. Listen, It is the lamb and his bride's right to rule this planet and rule from this planet. And Satan has always battled the lamb for control, governmental control of this planet. He will never win. The father will see that the lamb reigns from this planet with his bride over all of the universes, plural, of his creation. So, now, we have to understand something. I want to back up for a second and just speak about eternal purpose for a moment. The lamb is not the lamb because he was slain. The lamb was the lamb before he was ever slain. The lamb was slain, though. Lamb is a reference not to the fact that he was slain. Lamb is a reference to the eternal nature of the Godhead. There's much proof of this in the scriptures. I'm just throwing it out there. I'm not speaking specifically as I have many times about this. Lamb is a reference to God's eternal nature. God does not rule by power. He rules as lamb. He overcomes through his giving himself, his bestowing himself, his laying himself down. That is how he rules. Aren't you thankful? It is Satan who rules by power. It is Satan who is the control freak who has raised up in this earth every form of government on this planet, including the one of our own nation, going back to our republic, that is nothing but, let me just say this to you, get upset if you want to, at its best, we're a resistor to the Lamb's rule. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Because we think it's all about what our forefathers did. They didn't have a clue either. Listen, brothers and sisters, God placed us on this planet to taste the rule and government of evil. That's part of why we're here. And to make us hungry for the reign of the Lamb. Aren't you hungry for that? I am done with this nonsense. I'm double done with this nonsense. There isn't a government that's ever been among men that's going to do it for us. You can't vote it in. You can't create it. There is one government that we were meant to live under and be a part of it, and it is the government of the Lamb. I'm not saying don't vote. I'm just telling you you can't vote it in. I know this is pissing a lot of people off, and I don't really care. Listen, folks, the dynamic here has to be that we understand something. We are here to taste evil so that we will, when reigning with the Lamb, never turn to it. We must taste it. You're going to have to eat of it. You're going to have to have your fill. How many had their fill in this room? I've been filled with it. The greatest movement of God that is needed in our time is not getting back to a republic in this nation. The greatest movement of God that is needed in our time is the movement of a lamb within our hearts. And until that happens, we're pissing in the wind. 
That's what's going on. Listen, folks. I know. I'm from Tennessee. Listen. And you came to Tennessee. I'll be real blunt with you. Yeah, that's right, Mark. Listen, guys. This is nonsense that's going on. We're standing for things like cheerleaders. I'm done with that nonsense. We need the lamb. He is the sole single answer to the issue. Amen. I don't mean that as to be pacifists. Being a, a, the bride is not being a pacifist. It's understanding the real battle that is going on. What's going on in our nation and in the nations of the earth are the kings. Psalm 2 is in, in, in play. This is what we're seeing. They're taking their stand against the lamb. That's who they're taking their stand against. Listen, the cherub called Lucifer was given a position of watching over this planet, a covering role of this planet. It was a divine assignment from God the Father to him to watch over this planet because the lamb was going to bring forth a bride from this planet. Lucifer had a covering role in this planet. But it was not, his rebellion was not to take the throne of God. His rebellion was to take the throne of the lamb on this planet. And it was the bride, Eve, that he tempted to do it. Amen. Now that's eternal things. And Adam did exactly what the Lord has done with his bride to secure his bride. He did not put her away. He became one with her in her death. In order, this is the nature of the lamb, in order to win back his bride. Amen. That's why Adam did what he did, whether he knew it or not. The nature of the lamb is being shown in the passage. All right, well, so the lamb is not a reference to simply his sacrifice. The sacrifice of the cross happened because his nature is lamb. That's why it occurred. Why am I saying all this? Because it's easy to glorify salvation to the point that salvation is all we're after and miss the eternal purpose. Before man ever fell, God was looking for a bride. I want to say that to us again. Before man ever fell, God was after a bride. Salvation is nothing more than the way back to original purpose. Nothing more. It is not the goal nor the end result. The goal is to become the bride. I just want to say this to you. Genesis chapter 2, for this cause, a man shall leave father and mother. Here's the eternal plan and scope. And come out and be joined to his bride. Listen, here's the purpose of God before the fall. And the two shall become... You're here and I'm here to become one with the Lamb. It is the bridal paradigm in view. That's eternal purpose. The church has been notorious for preaching the way back to the purpose without ever preaching the purpose. So we're all hung up on salvation and think salvation is going to do it. And people are asking me and you questions, what's this all about? And why did God do all this? And we are giving them the most stupid answer I can imagine. You just need to get saved. Well, they do need to get saved, but that does not answer their question. God is locked up within mankind, a philosophical question. Why are you doing this? It does not offend God to ask him that question. We'll talk more about that aspect of the bride. I said I wouldn't say a lot about it tonight, and I'm not, but the next time I share. What I want us to see is this, though. Before there was the necessity of salvation, there was a bridal purpose. 
So Genesis chapter 2 shows us that purpose. How does it show us that purpose? Adam does not have his kind. He does not have a bride. He does not have a partner. He does not have a companion. And you can read as I can read. Revelation chapter 19. The bride has made herself ready. And what happens in Revelation 19 when the bride makes herself ready for the lamb? The lamb comes and puts an end to the age. That is divine sequence. Listen, folks, until the bride makes herself ready for the lamb, the lamb's not coming back. Peter understood this. Looking for and hastening that day is possible if we allow the bridal paradigm into our hearts to make ourselves ready for the Lamb. God's timepiece is not set at a random time. God's eternal timepiece is in conjunction with the bride making herself ready for the Lamb. That's when he's coming back. You can read it in Revelation 19. Nothing could be be clearer than that passage of Scripture. She makes herself ready. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb because not all the church is invited. Let me say it again. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb because not all the church is invited. One more time. Matthew 25, only five of the virgins were ready and entered in. The others stood knocking on the outside of the door because they were not ready. Ready to be the bride of the Lamb. There's a huge distinction between the church and the bride. The bride is a remnant Listen, I want to say it plainly. There's a huge distinction between the salvific order and the bridal order. One is dealing with a rescue. The other is dealing with eternal purpose. We better get a clue, folks, real fast. God is going to be screaming at this at us in the coming days. I'm announcing something. A few others are. Paul Keith Davis, Rick Joyner, a few others are announcing it. Some of us didn't even believe it before. You get a clue when Elijah shows up and tells you your theology sucks. <laughs> you don't know anything. I never claim to know anything. That's what's safe. I don't, I'm not as interested in knowing things anyway. I just want to know the Lord, don't you? Listen. So listen, there's something that is happening in our day. We have crossed out of a former time in the spirit, and we have entered a time that we have been reading about in our Bibles where God, before the coming of the Lamb to end the age, would release the spirit and power of Elijah to make ready a people, a bride, ready for the Lamb. We are in that day. I announce that to you from the Lord. We are in that day. We are in the day we've read about in our Bibles. We have entered that day. That's the day we're living in. Have I said that clear enough? It is the day that we are in. How can you be so sure? Because of the number of times Gabriel has come to me recently to announce it, to force me to say what I'm saying to you tonight. Gabriel showing up in my basement. Elijah, Elisha, the sons of Elijah, Elisha, and John the Baptist showing up in the basement. We're about to have a company of men and women baptized in the spirit and power of Elijah, immersed in the spirit and power of Elijah. They are the sons of Elijah coming forth. That's not a gender, feminine or masculine gender issue. It is not. It is a company. I'm announcing that to us. Some of us have known this for years, but there's a difference between calling and commission. The church hasn't realized that yet. Called of God is not the same as commissioned of God. There are years between those two things, and the the significance of those years are becoming approved of God. 
And that's not where the Western culture operates. If you've got a gift, you're called to go minister. Nonsense. So we've got a bunch of, listen, we've got a bunch of immature people running around trying to operate in gifts, gifts and accomplish things that only the Spirit of God and the Spirit of burning within can accomplish. That's what's been going on and that's what's going on. The Lord told me directly, you've been trying to get there with your gifts without understanding it. It's the spirit of Christ and the spirit of burning that's going to get you there. Amen. That's good preaching. I don't care what you think about it. It's real good. Thank you, sister. That's gooder than good. So we're living in a time now to where we're going to hear and see some things that if you can be offended, you will be. I'm, that's why I'm trying so hard. I'm saying things like pissed you off and all that. I'm trying to offend you. Because if you think that's harsh, folks, you ain't lived yet. Yeah, that's right. Come on. Wait to what you're about to see, what I'm about to see. Why, do, why would I say this? The fear of the Lord is coming. I've already been watching this. I, I directly intervened between Elijah killing someone in one of my services. You think I'm playing games? I am not. I directly intervened to keep Elijah from killing someone in my service. I've never done that in my life. I hope to never do it again. He drew his sword. I asked him, what in the world are you doing? I am going to strike them. I said, wait, 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 wait. Don't strike them. He said, I've drawn my sword, and I will not resheath it until I strike. I said, strike me instead. And he did, right into my heart. It only energized me. It would have killed them. We are living in a time when I, I can't sit up here and say, man, I know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. All I can tell you is the seriousness of this hour. I've learned by that encounter not to be frivolous. Folks, we are in a time where being frivolous is going to get us killed. And the Ananias and Sapphira stuff is going to get us killed. Playing games with God is going to get us killed. I I don't know how to say that to you any other way. This is a serious, serious, serious time. Serious time. God is already changing the tide. Listen, tell me this directly. I've changed the tide, Terry. Great storm. The release of the spirit of Antichrist is coming. But I have changed the tide. I have released the spirit and power of Elijah. And I've released Elijah back into the earth. Come what may, I tell you this. God has the final hand in this thing. Amen. So there is, in this ministry, you can identify this ministry in what's called the sons of Elijah. Those two sons, as I said, are Elisha and John the Baptist. Real quickly with Elisha. Elisha is anointed with the double portion of the spirit and power of of Elijah. Elisha finishes the work. Here's the end time ministry that Elijah could not finish. Amen. Now, I want to warn us with the release of the spirit and power of Elijah is a release of a demon. I've encountered the demon, so I'll talk to you about him. Whenever God releases the spirit and power of Elijah, he releases a, allows the release of a specific demon. That demon directly resisted Elijah. It was meant to. I had it to encounter me in, in Minnesota. Sc- scared me. And I've seen a lot of demons. I'm not usually scared by demons. But when I rebuked it, it laughed at me. And I asked the Lord quickly, I said, Lord, what in the world is going on? And here's his explanation. Whenever I release the spirit and power of Elijah, I release this demon in order to keep those operating in the spirit and power of Elijah to their task and course. The demon is divinely designed by the Lord and purpose 
to resist the company that's coming out to the Lord, moving in the spirit and power of Elijah. It keeps us dependent upon the Lord. It keeps the lamb in focus. I wouldn't have believed that a few months ago. I had to encounter it to believe it. Paul the apostle wrestled with this demon. He asked the Lord three times, take it from me. He's a messenger of Satan. And it's not just singular, it's actually a company of them. And the Lord told him, my grace is sufficient for you. Elijah wrestled and lost with the demon. Elisha defeated it. John the Baptist defeated it. The sons of Elijah defeated the demon. How, Terry? By allowing the lamb to establish his rule within them. That's how you defeat it. So let's look at the, thus, in Elisha, the son of Elijah, and you know the passage there in 2 Kings, where, and, and backing up to 1 Kings, where Elisha's request is, I want a double portion of your spirit. Elijah's answer is, you've asked for a difficult thing. It's not an impossible thing, it is a difficult thing. Right. Why would I say that? I'm bringing that out for this purpose because we live in an entitlement society that believes we get it because we want it. And I'm here just to mess with that for a second. You do not. There's a cost to this. There's a price to pay. The invitation of God to be the bride is to all of humanity. But as the Lord said to me, my invitation demands a dedication. It demands it. It is not optional. It demands a choice. It demands a dedication. It demands a consecration. It demands a commitment with longevity attached to it. Well, listen. Elisha, thus, as a son of Elijah, he calls Elijah my father. You read it in Kings. Elisha asks for the double portion. Elijah tells him, if you see me, it's very important, if you behold me when I go, your request will be answered. So Elisha must stick with him in that place of commitment. Elijah is calling Elisha to the place of ultimate consecration, commitment, dedication. Get the picture? Yeah. You must be with me. So he is. Even when Elijah's saying, I need to go here and you stay here and I'll go there. And no, 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 no. Elisha won't have any of that. No, no, I'm going with you. Wherever you're going, I'm going. So, as we know, thus, when Elijah is taken up in fire, and the ministry of Elijah is always surrounded by fire, when Elijah is taken up in the fiery chariot, the mantle of Elijah falls, Elisha picks up the mantle, strikes the waters, goes back over, strikes the waters. Now, notice his words, not where is Elijah, it's not what he says, where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? He is invoking the Lord. Directly. It isn't men and women of God that we're after here. It is the Lamb. I, I know Elijah appears. I've seen him. I've seen him here tonight. I know he's in the room. And he's not the only one in the room. I'm really being bold now, aren't I? <laughs> but it isn't Elijah that does it for me. It's not meant to do it for me. Elijah might strike me if he's what does it for me. That ministry is towards the lamb, upon the lamb. So let's move to John the Baptist real quickly. Now I don't have time to go into all these scriptures. I'm, I can pick back up on this. The entire ministry of John the Baptist surrounds the lamb. So Gabriel's pronouncement, and Gabriel's always in the mix. I didn't know that to the Lord. I, I've read the scriptures, but I couldn't see it. There's a lot of things I read, you read. Can't see it, though, as God would have us to see it until he opens these eyes spiritually to see. And Gabriel's appearance to me brought this passage up. I have always been involved around the spirit and power of Elijah. Because Gabriel is a birthing angel. Tell me that 20 years ago in an encounter. 
He's a birthing angel. God is about to birth, and travail will be a part of it. God is about to birth, so to speak, a company of people who are going to come out to him and be his bride. Birth in this sense. Like what happened with Adam. Where did his bride come from? Right within him. To have kind, to have kind, to have image, to be conformed to the image of Christ is to become the bride. To be transformed is to become the bride. For Adam to have his kind, the woman must be brought out of him. So Adam goes into a sleep, a type of death. And from that death or sleep comes the bride, his wife, whom he called Eve. God never called her Eve. God called her Adam. So, said all this then to point to this fact. John the Baptist's ministry revolves around this issue then of the one coming behind him. When they asked John in Matthew chapter 3, who are you? Are you are you the Messiah? No, I am not. Are you Elijah? No, I'm not. He didn't have a complex. Elijah complex. Are you the prophet? That's uh, they're speaking of Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse number 15. Are you the prophet Moses talked about? Then unless you there's a prophet coming beyond me, past me. And unless you believe everything that that prophet says, you'll be cut off from the people. Speaking of the, actually the son of God himself. No, I'm not that. Who are you then? I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. He quotes Isaiah 40. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make ready a people. This is what this ministry is all about. Make a people ready for the lamb. That's the ministry of John the Baptist. John goes right at it. It is John who's told by the Lord, you'll recognize the Lamb of God. You'll recognize the Son of God by this sign. The one on whom, when you're baptizing, and John's out baptizing, listen, I want to hit this, and of what is a baptism of repentance, which is about to hit the church. just want to say that to you. A baptism of repentance is coming to the church. Not just the fact of repenting about past sins that we've committed that God's already forgiven. I mean this, uh, this type of baptism or repentance. A baptism of repentance because of the compromise and the mixture that we've had in our midst. Something other than the lamb has done it for us. And spiritual adultery in the Old Testament is how God types idolatry. Because God himself, the Son of God, came out to possess a bride. And in the book of Revelation chapter 19, he receives her. So between those two books are 64 other books, all pointing to that reality. The lamb is coming out to possess a bride. He's leaving his father to come possess that bride. There is eternal purpose in this. Here's what we believe, though. We've made everything that God's doing about the last 8,000 years of humanity. And that's where we live. So God's just doing something for 8,000 years out of eternity, and the rest of eternity is us floating around on clouds playing harps. Let me just dispel that theory. No, no, no. The bride is here to be trained to be the bride. That's why you're here. Had man never fallen, Satan was in the garden so that he would learn in the midst of that test how to allow God to rule within him over evil. You are here and I am here to be tested. The Lord told me this in an encounter directly. 
concerning our time here upon the earth. Why? Why, when we get saved, does the Lord just not snatch us out of here? Because we're here to be trained. That's why. We're not here to get saved. We're here to be trained. Salvation became a necessity. But the purpose lay in the possession of a bride. We've got to see this, folks. People are asking questions about what this is all about. It's about a bride. It's part of the eternal purpose. God was wanting a bride, but it's a bride prepared, not an immature bride reigning with him on a throne, a bride who is made ready by the pedagogue, the Holy Spirit, who's been given to us to train us from children to we are sons. By the body of Christ and leaders in the body of Christ, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, their real function is to make ready a people to move them into the bridal paradigm. We think it's about supernatural gifting because we're stupid. <laughs> How you like that one? You will never know an apostle by their supernatural gifting. You will only know them by the measure of Christ that there is in them and by their laying of the foundation of Christ through them. Same thing about a prophet or prophetesses. This is not a male gender issue. We have glorified supernatural gifts and missed the true function of these ministries. They are meant to make ready a people. That is their purpose. Does the supernatural surround them? Absolutely, but no more than anyone else. Yeah. If God has his way in it, because the part of the training and having the foundation of Christ laid in us is for us to get out of our natural-minded Western culture, Greek thinking that believes it's more real because I can see it with my eyes than what I can see in the spirit. When what I see in the spirit is what is eternal, not what you're seeing with your eyes. It's real, but temporal. Somebody's got to stand up and say this stuff. I'll say it. We, most of us, have never been taught on how to see in the Spirit, and we think it's weird. That's because, well, forget it. (laughs) That's because we prophets and whatever, I'm not including myself, but because the prophets and prophetesses believe it's about gifting rather than the measure of Christ in us. No, 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 folks. Gifting is never a substitute for relationship. I'm not talking about being gifted. I'm talking about relationship with Jesus. My sheep know my voice. There's no cap on that. You are meant when you're born again to see with your spirit. You're meant to hear. You're meant to have our spiritual senses trained. Amen. Amen. But we're so strong-minded, and many of us have demons coming through our families, right? Still clinging right here. I'm just going to really hit it. Just hold steady for a second. Not being mean. I'm trying to help us. We still got demons clinging in there. So I thought, that can't be real. I can't see it. I can't work it out on the slide rule. Can't type it into the computer. Can't the... God can't be measured that way. He is spiritually discerned. Anyway, I'm trying to help us in that. The access point of seeing in the Spirit was what was formerly your imagination. Want me to say it again? I will. The access point of seeing in the Spirit is what was formerly, before you were born again, your imagination. And I don't want to go down that line tonight because there's not time, but I want to say that to us. Listen, if I can feel something, I can see it. And not with these natural eyes. No, I see a lot of things with these natural eyes. Well, you know what I do when I see things with these natural eyes? I'm talking about things in the spirit. I inwardly go immediately to see it correctly because Satan can deceive these and he cannot deceive this. How's that grab you? Amen. That's good. (laughs) It's good. See, it's not for the few, the proud, the elite. It's for the whole of the body. And if the apostles and prophets and evangelists, pastors and teachers are doing, functioning according to God's purpose, the training that is going on of the reality of becoming the bride for the lamb involves our being able to hear, our being able to see, our being able to get out of this this natural, solical-mindedness. And be able to engage with God who happens to be a spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. Enough of that. 
That sidetracked me for a few moments. It's worth saying, though, and it's worth helping us because, you know, well, I didn't see Elijah standing there. That's because you looked with your natural eyes. Come on. Come on. You're not going to see much with your natural eyes. You may see flashes. You may see tokens. You may see. I've seen Elijah with my natural eyes, but I've seen him way more with the eyes of my spirit. And the lamb. There's a whole lot of saints. I'm not talking about you guys in this room. I don't aim to remain blind. How about you? I was not born again to be blind. I was born again to see. So I'm trying to help us. What we've done is turned all this over to the New Agers and the Satanists and the witches, and they are raising up children, teaching them what I'm trying to teach you, and it's going down like a rat sandwich in this ring. Yeah. Why is that? Because we believe the New Age and the witches and the Satanists more than we do the Lord. And all they're doing is counterfeiting. That's all they're doing. All right, well... Go on, let me finish here, at least tonight. So, so John the Baptist, and John particularly, we see this, is told of a sign. The one on whom you see the Spirit descending, he is the Son of God. John's baptizing, it's, it's historically said uh, that John baptized between a million and a half a million people were going to the wilderness to be baptized. I mean, it was no small move of God. How all of Judea, the Bible actually says all of Judea in Jerusalem was going out to him. When the religious leaders came, spirit of fire, the proof of the spirit of fire bound around John the Baptist's life, the spirit of Elijah, was about to be seen. Who warned you to escape from the coming wrath, you brood of snakes and vipers? Bring forth fruit in keeping with repentance. Here's, let me just translate that into Tennessee language. <laughs> you want to be baptized, but you've not repented. You're living in a lifestyle of sin, this type of sin, unbelief towards right. God. Right. You do not believe in the Son whom I'm proclaiming, the Lamb that I am proclaiming. In fact, John could have said this, you don't even believe in me as the forerunner. Could have said that. So uh, John was not arrogant towards the Lord. He refused to baptize them without repentance. We thought baptism, water baptism, was just a thing we did some years ago, and da 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 da. And we thought being filled with the Holy Spirit, just put your fingers in your ears, you may not want to hear this. <laughs> We thought being filled with the Holy Spirit is something that had happened to me when I was five. Being filled with the Spirit of Jesus Christ is what happened to you when you were born again. It is not a second work of grace. It is the measure of Christ in us. But forget I just said that, because I can tell it's offending you and your doctrines, but I don't really care. The proof of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not speaking in tongues. The proof of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the measure of Christ formed in me. I've seen it over and over. I'm sure you have too, Larry. People speaking in tongues in the church. This is literal. And cussing people out in the parking lot right outside. The proof of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not any gift. Proof of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the measure of Christ formed in you and formed in me. That is the proof. It is an ongoing progressive infilling of the Spirit of Christ in us. Its initiation is Christ in you initially in being born again. But that's a salvific order. And if we do not progress forward into a depth of love and a height of love and a breadth of love beyond the initial love of salvation and into the deep waters of the God's love for his bride, that's right. 
If we do not progress into that love, we will never be one with him and his eternal purpose. Wow. And we will miss the very reason why he created humanity. To have a bride, not to save a people. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. We are excited about being saved and have lost the call, the eternal purpose that preceded the need of salvation to become the bride that God is after. Listen, to become the vessel through which, listen to me, he will transform the natural created universes from a creator-created relationship to a father-family relationship. The bride is the eternal vessel of that work. And we're still playing with sand pebbles on the beach. We have got to be awakened. This earth is the beginning. By the way, just put your ear. This earth is going to lose its gravitational hold in the future and go flying through space like a rocket ship as a memorial to the Lamb to all of creation. There will not be a place in any corner of any universes, and there are many, filled with beings. There will not be a corner when the work of the bride is done that is not filled with the light and life of the Lamb. That is the calling. It begins here in miniature. It ends in the magnitude of the next age. Just thought we'd want to know. They are waiting for us there, folks. And we're still playing with our toys. They've been promised our coming, the coming of the bride. God can create a creation, but he can't make it mature by creating it. There's another work, a final work, beyond the six days to create it that is needed. It is awaiting the coming of the bride. Whether you know it or not, if you become the bride, you will be an ambassador of the Lamb forever. It will be a work that never ends. We don't understand our relationships. Let me just go all out here. We don't understand our relationships, the eternalness of them. God is preparing in our relationship teams within the bride to sin to the four corners of all that's created. They're waiting for us that through the church the manifold wisdom of God may be made known to the heavenly rulers. And not talking about angels and authorities. We have to get into eternity in this, folks. We have to get to eternalness in this and step out of time, this 8,000-year time frame that's all about the making ready of a bride and back to the original intent for that bride. And I'm not talking about all of it right here. I'll do that later. I'm just giving us a little bit of the hint of where I'm going with this. No, brothers and sisters, many of us are bored out of our mind with present-day religion. Many preachers are bored out of their mind. They've seen everything, done everything, tasted everything, and they can't hear anything. Let me say it again. They've seen everything, done everything, heard everything, but they can't really hear anything anymore. And you know why? Because we have made God into this box. And he is about to blow our box up. And get us back on track to eternal purpose that begins here. Listen, I want to impress this upon you. You are here to be tested. So if you're going through a test and you just came through it and you're, you know, sigh of relief. I've got the word of the Lord for you. Another one's right around the corner. Here we go. Why would I say that to us? Because if we think that God somehow is angry or punishing us in the test, we have misread his purpose. Here's what the Lord told me. I said, I was going to say this. The school of Christ. Let's listen. The playground of Satan 
is attached to the school of Christ. That's why God allowed Satan into the garden. So that the bride would learn to be ruled from within over all evil. But they failed, didn't they? But that didn't end the purpose. That just brought in the need for salvation. Purpose preceded salvation. We've got to get on the eternal ground and we've got to read the book of Ephesians. That book's not of this world. And the Lamb of God, that nature is not of this world. So we have been called in this time to be prepared for the coming out. And I want to say this. John sees this. When he sees the Lord, he recognizes because of the descent of the dove. Here's what he says. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Amen. That was the ministry of the spirit and power of Elijah in that day resting upon John the Baptist. But let me describe last day's ministry because it is not that. It is the Lamb coming to possess the vessel of his purpose. He is coming for us. He's not coming to take away the sins of the world. He is coming for his bride, and there is no power anywhere that can stop him. He is coming to possess the vessel of his purpose. Before he comes to end this age, he's coming straight to us. He's after his bride. I want to be a part, don't you? Before there was a necessity of salvation, there was a choice. Any bride wants to make a choice for her husband. True? We don't like forced marriages, shotgun weddings. We want to make a choice. The bride would have to make a choice. Before there was a fall, the bride would have to make a choice. Do you want to be joined and become one with the Lamb? Will you be joined to him as a partner eternally, as a companion eternally? Will you be conformed to his very image? I've seen it. I've gone into the future, came back into the planet Earth, flying like a rocket ship, coming out back into the Earth that has been completely renovated. Very little water on the earth. There's a, uh, a city that is a wedding gift of the lamb to the bride that is 1,500 miles t- tall, sticking up off the earth, right above the earth, actually, sticking up 1,500 miles this way. The bride is the city, and God gives her a city as a wedding gift, as a memorial. I've seen it. There was a halo of the lamb's presence surrounding this earth. I entered into it and was shocked by the magnitude of the power of the presence of the Lamb upon my spirit. I saw ambassadors from the universe, other beings coming in to the earth, like the Queen of Sheba coming to behold the glory of Solomon. Watched them. This earth was filled with memorials. You could go to Mount Carmel and there was people of God stationed there to speak about the lamb on Mount Carmel and what happened with Elijah and his encounter. There were places throughout this earth. I go on and on. I'm just just throwing out a few little things here. Listen, Listen, folks. We've just made this thing so small. So small. God does not forget He will never forget. And he doesn't forget your commitment. He doesn't forget your consecration. He doesn't forget your dedication. He will never forget. I 
I looked, that's what I wanted to tell you. I looked at the throne of the Lamb. And the bride was with him on the throne, but I could not see a distinction between the two. They are one. She is with him wherever he goes. You know this and I know this. Right here, I want to come right at your spirit. You were meant, you were created for that purpose. You were meant to be that. I want to hit us right between the eyes with that. You can only make the choice to be the bride in this earth. You'll never have another opportunity. I cannot stress the importance of this to you. My dad, who I led to the Lord, he's not going to mind. He knows what I'm saying. I've encountered him several times. He went to be with the Lord in 2007, December. The Lord has allowed him to come to me several times and me see him in heaven. My dad lived all of his life and never made the choice to be the bride, and he never will be. Because the choice to be the bride by divine design can only be made here. You are here to make the choice. Don't squander your time. I cannot emphasize that strong enough to you. There's another choice in this beyond salvation and beyond salvation, salvific love and salvific purpose. There is a bridal purpose and a bridal love. There's a depth of God's love that only the bride will forever enter into. A height of it, a width of it, a depth of it, and breadth. To know the love of Christ, that surpasses understanding. You were created for that. Now is your choice and your time of choice. You won't have, and I won't have another opportunity in this. That choice, the Lord told me this directly, can only be made now. God purposed to make his bride ready in the context of testing. That's why the choice can only be made here. May we not be frivolous with our time and waste it. I cannot overemphasize. We are a distracted people. We are an offended people. We are a people made dull. I'm not being mean. I hope you don't take it mean. I'm just trying to go right at our spirit for a second. Our distractions are killing us. Our stuff is no substitute for him. It's not what I possessed. I want to be possessed of the Lord. I want to be his possession. Don't you? I want to be his bride. May we give up freely right now the sin that so easily is entangling us. Particularly, if I might say this, the sin of other things prioritized before the Lamb. May we become in our hearts a people, wholehearted. Let's go all the way in this, folks. I'm, I'm just, I can't live in status quo. I never could. I don't want to live there, do you? I have no desire to just a live. Well, I got, G- I got Jesus 30 whatever years ago. No, 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 folks. I want the fire of his passion burning within me, don't you? He wants that for us. He wants to satisfy us. He wants to be our satisfaction. He wants to be everything to us. If we will let him, he will be that to us. To make us hungry. How many in this room, you don't have to raise your hand, but you can't hear. How many in this room said, Terry, I want to be hungry again for the Lord. I've seen it all. Listen, I want to speak to those who've been in ministry. The way we look at that sucks, but let me just talk about it for a second. (laughs) Every one of us in this room is a minister, if Jesus happens to be in you. But anyway, listen, been in ministry and you've been burned, and you've been wounded, and you've been offended, and you've been hurt, and you've been crushed, and that's the good points. Now let me talk about the other side of the coin. Oh, that's the bad ones. And you felt like you had a bullseye on your chest, and you did, for people to shoot at. 
It's that thing, that weight that the Lord wants to lift off of our hearts right now. Will we risk again being wholehearted to him? Or will we cling to our choice to withdraw and to measure ourselves out to the Lord in accordance with our own measurement? Will we hold ourselves back from wholeheartedness? Are we living to protect ourselves? Or with caution to the wind, are we his come what may? I will not live, I refuse to live with caution, fear, controlled by my past experiences that are not allowing me to go forward and become a member of the bride that he's called me to be. How about you? Say, but Terry, you don't know what's happened. You don't know what happened to me either. But the question is not that. Is God bigger than that is my question. And can God heal? Can God repair the broken heart? Can he heal scar tissue? Amen. He can. Yes, he can. So, brothers and sisters, and everybody else back there. <laughs> I don't know what time it is. Let's see. Yeah, I think I might be able to at least stop preaching and see what the Lord wants to do. My call to us tonight, my challenge to us tonight, right off the start of this, is to become the bride of the Lamb that He created us to be. To give ourselves wholeheartedly to Him again. I really want to say that to our hearts, every one of us. Many of us in here have been wounded. If you're going to be in any capacity, in any realm, ministering the Lord, you're going to be hurt. If you can't be hurt, you can't love. God only uses broken vessels, weak vessels, crushed vessels. Our strengths don't allow him to be strong. I'm way too strong for God to be strong. Will we willingly make a choice to become the bride he created us all to be? Will we make that choice? I'm asking for us to make a choice tonight beyond salvation, to come out of salvific order and into a bridal paradigm dealing with eternal purpose. It's absolutely what I'm doing. I'm making a clear distinction. I'm pushing us, aren't I? I mean to push us. Salvation is not what you were created for. Being the bride is. You were created to be the lambs. Amen. Possessed of him. An eternal royal priesthood ministering the lamb to all of creation. What Revelation says, he's made us to be a kingdom of priests forever. To who? Not humanity. All right. So, while the Spirit of the Lord's in the room, and He's been in the room, just want us to stand for a second. How many would say with me, Terry, I have been cut and bruised and wounded and hurt and I've been done that way and I've done others that way to my shame.
Or I'm beginning to see, Lord, that there's more to this than just salvation. I'm beginning to see there is an eternal purpose bound up in this. And I'm determined to be a part of it. And I want to be a part of it. And I want to come out to you tonight, Lord, and become a part of your bride by my own choice. Awaken me tonight to be a part of your bride. You just put up your hand and say, man, I want to be a part of the bride, Terry. I want to come out of simple thoughts of just being saved and getting in by the skin of my teeth. come into alignment with the purpose for which I was created the purpose for which I was saved and Lord you see our hearts not just our hands you see our hearts I ask Holy Spirit tonight I ask that you would awaken us awaken us in our hearts I ask you to deal with the religion and the hurt and the pain and the stupidity and the nonsense in the Bible teaching, in the Bible training, in the lack of the Holy Spirit, in the lack of understanding, in the lack of faith, in the lack of trust. I ask you to deal with that tonight. I ask you, Lord, to crush in us every type of resistance to you. The walls, the barriers that we've erected or allowed to be erect. The offense, Lord, that's come into our hearts. We ask you to deal with the pride in me, the pride in us. We ask you to deal with the self-sufficiency that we've grown into rather than you being our sufficiency. Break the power of the strongholds in us tonight, Lord. Mold us tonight. Release the spirit of travail among your people tonight, Lord. We are not okay and we will never be okay with the present state and affair of condition of things. You're after a bride. You are after a bride that is one with you in name. One with you in name. One with you in life. One with you in presence. One with you in glory. come out to you tonight out of sin out of pride and arrogance out of self-centeredness out of the stronghold of Christian religion out of our past out of our present and into your purpose we come out tonight Lord we come out and Lord we run out to you honestly it is an escape from the dullness and the boringness of living in a life and not understanding why we're here, why we were meant to be here, and that for such a time as this, you placed us in. We were meant to be born in this time. Forgive us, Lord, where our jobs have taken precedence over that place of utterness and wholeheartedness to you. Thank you for our jobs. But teach us, Lord, how to be wholehearted and utter in the midst of our jobs. Because, Lord, there's a true mission field there. Teach us how to be wholeheartedness in the marketplace. Some of us are in major transition. We ask tonight, Lord, for you to be the one who ordains our steps in this time of transition. Some of us are meant to take the plunge and go into business. Give us your confidence in that. Give us your understanding in that. Give us your purpose in that, Lord. Some of us are made meant to take the step and come out of business. Give us, Lord, tonight courage. Offset the fear, the trepidation. You're our Father. 
You're more than that. You're our husband. We would ask tonight, Holy Spirit, for that baptism of repentance. I'm just going to ask that tonight. Don't pray it if you don't mean it. I'm not encouraging you to, you have to pray this. I'm just going to pray it over us. I ask for the baptism, the immersion of repentance again. I ask for the fire of God in it. The baptism of repentance upon us. Where there's been compromising, where there's been mixture, where there's been half-heartedness, where there's been a divided heart. Give us an undivided heart that we may fear your name. Give us wholeheartedness. Give us utterness towards you, Lord. It shames us that we have not made you our priority. Rekindle. I ask, Holy Spirit, there's a fire going to be released in this. I can see the Lord already beginning it. Blow up on the embers of our heart, O oh God, and rekindle the fire. Rekindle the flame of God within us. We repent of our divided heart, oh God. We repent of our divided heart. We repent of the sin of idolatry and placing other things and people in front of you. us to be a people, a vessel prepared. Your vessel, Lord. Not general. Your vessel. A vessel that is prepared. A vessel that is made ready by the Spirit of God within us. And that, Lord, we ourselves make ourselves ready to be your bride. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Spirit of burning, we release. Blow up on the embers, Holy Spirit. Fan into flame within us that fiery passion for the Lamb of God, for this eternal one, before time, before there was a, a creation, any creation. You have forever been the Lamb. Beautiful one, lovely one. We thank you for the invitation to be united with you. We thank you for the invitation to be one with you. We thank you for the invitation to the vocational calling that awaits us in eternity. That begins now, but the fullness awaits us in eternity outside of time to the furthest reaches of creation. Lamb of God, we come out to you out of the religious nonsense, out of the crazy Christian intellectualism that's crept within the church, out of doctrines of demons that we bought into. come out to you. That's right. Let travail come forth, folks. Spirit of travail. Spirit of the Lord in travail come forth. Fire of God, burn upon us. <laughs> 